Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul J. in Baltimore, and welcome to a new edition of Reality Asserts Itself. Robert Paris Moses became one of the most influential leaders of the black civil rights movement in the 1960s and afterwards. Martin Luther King called his grassroots organizing an inspiration. Moses is one of the leaders of the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. He was also an organizer for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964. And we now have the pleasure of Mr. Moses joining us in the studio. Thanks very much for joining us, Bob. Right. And I should say Bob Moses, because I think that's how you're right. known. Yeah. Bob Moses is an educator and civil rights activist. During the 1960s, he was the field secretary for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, as well as the main organizer of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project that helped register black voters in the Deep South. He was also an outspoken critic against the Vietnam War. From 1969 to 75, he worked as a teacher for the Ministry of Education in Tanzania. In 1982, he re received a MacArthur Fellowship, and he used those funds to develop the Algebra Project, an organization aimed at improving math education in poor communities. Bob is also the author of Radical Equations, Civil Rights from Mississippi to the Algebra Project, and co-editor of Quality Education as a Constitutional Right, creating a grassroots movement to transform public schools. He's also earned a master's in philosophy from Harvard. Thanks very much for joining us. Right. Now, how big an impression, how much was it part of your formation? World War II, you're, you're 10 when it's over, and then the years as you're becoming a teenager, it's, it's the thing people are still talking about all through the late 40s. Uh, how, and, and what's your sense of, of being an American and, at this point, and, and what that means as, as a black American? So, um, so part. So, I have a, a sense um, uh, in during the war. I mean, what I remember out the war is standing on long lines to get some sugar. Right? Um, um, there is no A and P in Harlem. So, all this time while we were growing up, uh, twice a month, um, my mother, and my brother, and I, we walk um, roughly a couple of miles. Uh, going and coming to the nearest AMP, which is in the Bronx. So there's no, no grocery store in Harlem. No AMP. This is, uh, they're little mom and pop kind of grocery stores, but no place where on my father's salary we could feed our family, right? So twice a month we go up, uh, walk across um, the bridge up to this nearest AMP. But um, during the war, um, you stood on long lines to get uh, margarine or sugar, right, because uh, they were rationing that. Um, and um, so that's my big memory uh, about the war and my aunts, my father's sisters, uh, who are, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, street stuff uh, in terms of clothing, nylon stockings, Right, all of this is scarce, right? So, but, but in terms but of what the war was about, the, the, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, propaganda to develop more patriotism. Well, amongst we Americans play a game. So we had this game that we play. You take a ball, right? Uh, five of us gather in the pit. What was great about the projects is you had this pit, right? Um, it took up the part of the projects I lived in took up three blocks. So they had two pits in this and you could play down in the pit. There were benches around it, trees, parents could watch, right? So one of the great things was I could, I could fall out of the house um, uh, and go outside and stay all day, right? Um, so, but we had a game we played. Uh, you get a ball, you throw it high as you can up in the air. Everybody is a country, and you say, I declare war on, right? and you name a country, so the country that's name has to come back, catch the ball, everybody else runs, right? And then his job is to hit somebody with the ball. Now there's a little rubber ball, so he has to throw it and try to hit. That person that's hit then comes back and declares war. So, and we did a lot of marching. I, I just remember, you know, we get four or five and it's left, right, you know, and we're marching in order, turning, uh, and the thing was you give a string of 10 commands, right? Uh, double to the left, right flank, so forth, 
right? And then you have to, everybody has to follow those commands. But, right? do, but do you internalize what a lot of people from that generation did, especially white people, um, that this is America has fighting for freedom and America stands against fascism and against dictatorship and no, here's what we won the war me, for, for everyone's um, liberation and such. What happens to me is that um, in high school, right, I'm, I'm going to school with Al Prettyman. I mean, I'm sorry, Al Poussin, right? I went to college with Prettyman. But uh, so uh, Dr. Poussin, um, and I don't know if you remember Dr. Poussin with the Cosby Show. He was the psychiatrist who really set the tone for the Cosby Show. His father has a, um, a print shop. But the only people who will actually give him work are the communists in New York. So Al ends up going to the red diaper baby summer camps, right? Camp Wochika and some others, right? So um, I try it for one summer, but I don't like it because th what they do is they walk around singing songs, right? So, um, but in the, e in the winters, they go to the Hootenannies downtown in the village, right? And I tag along because my brother and Al like the camps, they became junior counselors and then counselors and so forth. But at these hootenannies, uh, the people like Pete Seeger are singing. And this is where I learn about lynching and this country, right? You start to get a sense I of the start, South. Yes, I start to get a sense of the country, right? I'm, um, and and I had I had some confrontations at Stuyvesant. Um, one confrontation um, with Mr. Eifert. Um, Stuyvesant was on a split schedule, right? So you go in the afternoon uh, when you're in the 10th grade, so from 1 to 5, right? Um, I actually tested out, so I got into a special group within Stuyvesant, and so we had an extra class, started at 12, right? We had a homeroom teacher, Mr. Blue. He was a kind of a really uh, kind of smooth, older person. He taught chemistry, no problems there. But after the first year, we switched to the morning program, we get a new homeroom teacher. He comes into our homeroom and starts to pick on me. I'm the only black kid in this class, right? Um, and I think he's picking on me because um, the idea that this is a special class and these kids have above normal IQs in Stuyvesant, right? So, um, but uh, the only person who really um, supports me uh, coming out is uh, Pagano. Um, he ended up, we were on the basketball team together, but he said, oh, he's a shit, you know. But no one else is really saying anything about this. We actually um, are kind of standoff enemies for the next two years, Mr. Eifert and myself, right? We end up actually throwing something at each other. But I didn't have any sense of my rights as a student. I just, this was just so a So go back weird, to the hootenannies right? when you're... So what I'm saying is yeah. I had begun to see at Stuyvesant, right, some picture about the country, right? But at the hootenannies, um, there were FBI agents. I was always coming, you see that guy over there? He's an FBI agent. This is the 50s, right? Um, the whole issue of McCarthyism is beginning to raise its head, right? So when I get to college, I turn 18 uh, in January of 1953, in the middle of my freshman year, and I've already really thought uh, through something about my, my, my situation vis-a-vis -vis the country. We have a draft, and I have to register with my draft board. And so I write the letter to them and say, well, I don't think I want to fight in any of the country's up-and-coming wars, right? Why? Um, and so I didn't think I wanted to fight in any of the up-and-coming wars, Why? right? Because I didn't think I wanted to fight for this country in any of its up-and-coming wars, right? We had just finished the Korean War, right? Um, and so one of my friends had gotten uh, shot down and didn't come back from Korea. And I'm thinking now, about uh, the country, 
um, what's going on in the country, um, what I'm learning uh, through these uh, hoot nannies and stuff like that. Um, I'm thinking back about Uncle Bill, right? What's, what's an uh, example of what you're learning in the hoot nannies? Well, um, it seems like uh, every other month there's a lynching in Florida. I mean, it, it just, you know, there's always an announcement about a lynching taking place, you know. We're going to continue this discussion with Bob Moses on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. Please join us. Mm -hmm.